Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm Declan Costello. I look after infrastructure and operations for Ryanair. Uh, we look after all of the back-end systems and all of the web customer-facing systems as well across networks, voice, uh, storage, Linux, Windows, and desktop operations. Um, I have obligatory marketing slides that wouldn't let me talk unless I put this up. Um, so everybody knows Ryanair. I presume everybody has flown Ryanair, as Glenn said. Um, we are the world's largest international airline by number of passengers crossing borders. Uh, we service 34 countries around Europe and uh, North Africa and Middle East, or parts of the Middle East. Uh, about 1,800 routes, 1,800 flights a day, going up to about 2,000 flights a day over the summer or over. Um, we have 120 million passengers this year. Um, we'll have about 200 million by FY24. Um, and we have to have 200 million because O'Leary has bought the planes. They're on their way. So we have to fill them with somebody. Um, there's a plane arriving every single week for the next three and a half years. Um, and 900 pilots have been hired a year and about 4,000 cabin crew have been hired a year. Hired a year. Um, so we're big and everybody knows us. So where did it all start for us on the uh, e-commerce front? Um, back in 2000, we used to sell seats via call center, via global distribution systems like Concur, um, and uh, via travel agents. And two students managed to talk their way into the building. Nobody's quite sure how they got in, but O'Leary just said yes to get rid of them. Um, and they went off and built a website for us. And literally, there were two students. There were 16, one of them was 16 and one of them was 17. Um, Nobody thought anything was going to come from this, but it was the right product, and this is a mantra you'll hear a few times, it was the right product at the right time. So within a few months, it was selling 50,000 bookings a week. It started to cannibalize our other channels. We started to sell everything. Uh, everything through, um, through the website. Uh, we closed our own call centers. We got rid of the travel agents. We got rid of the GDSs. Um, and it was just at the, the right place at the right time. But for about 14 years after that, we didn't do much in the way of innovation. So we ended up with customers that looked a little bit like that. Um, that's a typical customer after using our website circa 2007, 2008 maybe. Um, we needed to change. Um, so we wanted to be seen like this guy. We wanted to be seen like Robin Hood, taking, taking money from the high cost, high priced airlines and giving it back to our customers. But we had a kind of a bit of a problem because people thought we were like that guy, <laughs> which is not what we wanted at all. Definitely not what we wanted. We needed to change, so we needed to become as liked as we were useful. We were always very, very useful. We had the lowest cost flights across the highest number of routes uh, all over Europe, and that was a really useful feature, but people didn't really like us that much. Um, so we needed to change. So we needed to go from this, which is the old Ryanair. Everybody remembers the old Ryanair. It was a CEO who has literally got no shame when it comes to getting free publicity for Ryanair. Zero shame at all. Um, we had a website that had a color scheme that made your eyes bleed um, and a user experience that made you weep, like the guy in the previous slide. But underneath it all, we had the lowest cost prices across the lowest or the highest number of routes across all of Europe. So we had one good thing going for us. But we needed to change from that to this, where we now have... <laughs> We now have the, um, we've got lovely mobile apps on iOS and Android. We've got a lovely website that has a nice user experience. We've got prettier planes, uh, internals, the planes have changed. Uh, we've got the disturbing image of O'Leary wandering around the office hugging puppies. Um, but again, underneath it all, we've got the lowest cost, I've got to keep saying this, we've got the lowest cost prices, uh, the lowest cost fares across the highest number of routes across Europe than any, of any airline. So we needed to go from the old to the new. Um, we started this program called Always Getting Better back in uh, late 2013, I think. It started as a marketing IT initiative and then it ended up subsuming the whole company. Everybody's involved in it now. It's all about being nicer to customers, offering better products, offering the right product at the right price to the right customer at the right time. Um, so this Always Getting Better program, we've done three years of it, we're in year four. Uh, in the first three years, everybody knows what's changed. I'm not going to go through all of them, there's too much stuff. Um, but everybody knows, we've done allocated seats, priority boarding, we smile at customers now, we, um, we have new uniforms, which makes a big difference. Uh, we've got the My Ryanair, which I'll talk about a little bit more. But that's, a lot of the low-hanging fruit was done in year one, the easy stuff to fix, and then we fixed lots more things since then. This year, we're into year four. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these again. I'll just talk about two of them. The Connecting Flights was announced last week, and yesterday we did our first partnership with um, another airline, Air Europa. So now you can fly from, uh, with a, with, via the Ryanair website, you can book a ticket from Madrid to New York. 
not flying on our planes, but flying on Air Europa's planes, but we're going to do more of those sort of partnerships. Uh, My Ryanair is our profile system. So since November of last year, yeah, November of last year, it's now mandatory to have a profile. You have to sign in to book a seat. And the reason we're doing that is we want to collect as much data about our customers so that we can offer the right product at the right price to the right customer at the right time. So at the moment, we haven't started the customization really yet, but at the moment, you could be going on a two-week family holiday to the Algarve, and we will offer to let you take your skis with you, which is not a particularly useful product at that particular time. If you're a business customer, and if you're flying on a red-eye flight in the morning and flying home in the evening, why are we trying to sell you travel insurance? We shouldn't be. You're never going to take travel insurance. You might take a car. You'll certainly take airport parking, but you'll never take travel insurance. You'll never take baby seats. Why are we trying to sell you kid seats? We shouldn't be. So my Ryanair is the basis, is the, is the data mine for all of this, that we're going to customize the experience for each individual customer as, as you come onto the site. And once you're segmented as being a business customer, Business customers always take cars at the airport, hire cars. Well, why are you the one business customer that we can't flog a car to? And then we'll be able to change the offering, maybe give you a better deal, give you a special offer, or whatever it might be. So that's the stuff that's coming in the, in the coming year. Uh, how have we done all of this? Well, on the IT side, we did labs. So uh, IT used to be part of finance. It was a cost center within finance that nobody wanted to spend any money on. Um, and then we set up labs, Ryanair Labs, about three years ago. I'm there five years in total in, in Ryanair. Uh, I was number 42 in IT. There's 253 people now in IT. Um, so we've ramped up massively on the IT side. We have offices in main office in Dublin, obviously, but we have a development office in Roxlov in Poland and Madrid recently. And there's about three people there at the moment. Um, so Ryanair Labs was set up as an IT services company for, for Ryanair. I've gone ahead one, but anyway. Um, the idea being that we need to monetize some of our own IP. For the first 27 years of our life, we would go and buy software for the airline industry from ISVs. And we would end up buying a piece of software that was all things to all airlines. But we're a low cost carrier, so we have a very different model. We don't need all those features that the, the high cost carriers need. Um, so one of the things that Labs is doing is writing custom software for ourselves. And then we should be able to monetize that by selling it to other low cost carriers. This is the plan. Um, what have we done so far? Well, we've built an, uh, a new website, but we've actually done it three times in the last four years. We've re reskinned it once and completely built it, re rebuilt it uh, twice. Uh, the My Ryanair system, we're building screen scraping protection. It's not all customer facing. We're building iPad apps. So traditionally, high cost airlines will go to Boeing usually and buy the electronic flight bag suite from them. And they'll pay a fortune per pilot per year to get electronic flight bag, which is their charts and the the navigation and the weather and all those sorts of things that pilots need to take it off paper. But we're not like that. We're developing it ourselves for just the low-cost carrier model, for our model, and then we should be able to sell that to other low-cost carriers. Likewise with the cabin crew uh, EPOS devices on board uh, sales. Ryanair Rooms is the first phase of Ryanair as a service. Um, so one of, the things, one of the other things that we're trying to do is we're going to open up our back end via APIs to third parties. So it won't just be Ryanair's products that will be on our website. We want third parties to link into our website so that they can offer their right product at the right price, at the right time, to the right customer. Yeah. Um, knowing that we've got the busiest web, uh, airline website in the world, we have uh, one of the top 10 travel websites in the world, Airbnb and, and booking and stuff might be bigger, but we're in the top 10, and we're the only airline in there. Um, we have all these customers coming to our website. We know where these customers are going from, where they're going to, uh, who they're bringing with them, how often they do that type of trip. So that's all very usable data for third parties to help sell their products to the right person at the right time. Uh, so stuff coming down the line, Reiner as a service, and other, other stuff coming on, on, the, on the line. Uh, and just to reiterate, the reason that Reiner as a service we think will work is because we have this massive base of customers coming into us. And O'Leary has said that he wants us to become the Amazon of travel. Um, and that means that he wants us to be the travel website rather than just the airline website. He wants people to come to our website to, for all aspects of their trip, not just the airline flight seat. The, the seat. Um, so is all this stuff working? And it does work. Um, so three years ago we had 80 million passengers a year. Now we've got 120. Uh, we went from a load, a load factor is how many people are on the percentage seats sold on the plane, from 83 to 94. To put a real number on that, that's 19 extra people on every single flight we fly. 
1,800 flights a day. Um, so that's 19 extra people that have gone through the website to be able to be sold ancillaries or third-party products. It's 19 extra people on board every plane to buy whatever we sell on board, coffee, tea, perfume, whatever it might be. Um, our satisfaction ratings, we, we've turned the corner on that. We, we, people like us now. Um, and we've done all of this while we're still lower in fares. We've still got the lowest app fares of any airline in Europe across the widest destinations, the widest um, set of destinations. Uh, and we're cut 15% in the last couple of years as well. So where does New Relic come into all of this? I hear somebody from New Relic ask. Um, <laughs> so that's, that looks like Gary, uh, that someone from uh, New Relic may, may have given to me, but it didn't. That, I wrote that, right? It is true. We wouldn't be able to do what we do now uh, without New Relic. I'll give you a little brief history of what we used to do. So our old, our old website was a very simple thing. It was a static marketing front-end website and a separate booking website that was the dynamic part. Uh, and it was relatively simple um, and ugly and horrible to use and so on. But we used to just monitor it very basically with the traffic light system. Green was good, yellow was, it's going slow, red is, it's on fire in the corner. And at that point, we'd step in with developers and developer tools like Fiddler or Google, uh, Chrome developer tools or whatever, to try and figure out which particular piece of the website was at fault, which particular call to a third party was failing or responding slow or responding but responding with gibberish or whatever it might be. Uh, the turnaround time for fixes was slow, but that's okay because back then, if you remember, we didn't particularly care about things like fast response for customers. Um, that's changed now, obviously, as you all know. So now we use New Relic. So we started using it, uh, it says mid-2015, I only realized this morning it was earlier, it was March. We, when we deployed our new Android and iOS apps, the back-end API was the first thing to get instrumented with New Relic. And within a few weeks, we had gone back and instrumented the old website um, to give us more insights into it. Um, the new web platform went live on the 2nd of November 2015, and it had New Relic from day one. But I don't mean day one on the 2nd of November, it was about four or five months before that. It was on every developer's laptop, every integration environment, the UAT environment, the pre-staging environment, the staging environment, the production environment, everywhere. It's pervasive across the whole of IT now. Everybody's using it. Um, we have lots of dashboards, which you'll see there. How does that look? Yeah. Okay. Um, loads of dashboards. That's my monitoring wall um, in front of my desk, uh, on, on my team's desks. Um, we've got 10 screens up there, eight of which are New Relic, one of which is cycling through a further eight New Relic screens because we don't have enough space. Um, we do an awful lot of visual, uh, visual monitoring, visual alerting. We've got 24-7 guys in the, in the office. Um, we bombard enough people with enough alerts as it is from all the other systems. So for the customer facing stuff, we do a lot of it visually. Um, I have a better dash in a sec to show. And then we've got smaller dashes all around, the, all around the office. That's just one little picture of them. But beside sprint teams, there's a couple of monitors that they decide what metrics they want to put up on. So the developers are invested in it. They can see that the number of, I don't know, widgets that, they were, that their product was selling per minute was 1,000, and now it's 2,000. And it was because of that release that we did yesterday. So they're more invested in the process. They can see the fruits of their labors very quickly. And when it goes wrong, they can see they whatever the opposite of fruit of labors is. Um, so that's a, a typical main dashboard that we've got. Um, top three widgets are the critical things for us. Availabilities, check-ins, and segments. Segments is airline speak for seats. Don't ask me why. Um, so availabilities is the number of availabilities. If you do a search from Dublin to Gatwick tomorrow, that's an availability call. and comes back with all the flights that were flying, that, that were available. So we're doing about 20,000 of them a minute normally. Um, and we're always comparing to this point last week. There's no point as comparing to yesterday or to this morning. We have to compare to the same hour of the same day of the, of the, the week before. So on Monday night at 8 o'clock, it can only be compared to a Monday night at 8 o'clock. That's our busiest hour, 8 to 9 o'clock. Um, in that busy hour, we've done 50,000 seats, which when you work it all down, we're doing about five planes a minute for the entire hour. That's how many seats we're selling constantly. Um, so. When we see availabilities drop, we know that about two and a half minutes later, we're going to see the segments, the seats sold drop. If you can't do an availability, you won't be able to make a booking for a seat further on in the process. If people can't check in, they can't get on the plane. So it's not all about selling the seats. We're also um, monitoring what happens at the airports as well via New Relic. Um, an interesting one there is the actual versus predicted, that one. Um, that's where we take data from our commercial yield guys at about half eight every morning. They give us a file that predicts what they're going to sell minute by minute for the entire day. 
we pump that up into New Relic using their API, and then we plot against it what they're actually studying minute by minute for the whole day. And there, it looks pretty good. We're actually slightly ahead of target in places, so we'll take the credit for that. And if it ever goes the other way, the yellow line goes on top, it means that they've over, oversold their, their own predictions. Um, all of these dashboards feed one into the next so that we'll see a piece of information on this, like that availability average duration. If it spikes and goes slow, we'll know that there's another dashboard or another piece of data somewhere else that will help us figure out why is that gone slow. Um, an example of that would be the payments by status. So normally we see about 90, 91% payment approval. That's, that's good for us. Um, and about 7, 8, 9% uh, of declines. But if we suddenly see that approvals are dropping, we can go into another dash where we can see that it's not just approvals generally that are dropping, but it might only be approval for payments of a Sterling MasterCard or Polish Sloshy on Amex. So we can narrow it down to a particular card and, uh, card and currency type so that we know which particular bank and which particular payment provider to ring and shout at. Um, the old days, that particular issue will be solved probably about six to eight hours later when the finance guys did a report and realized that, hey, where have all of our GBP MasterCard payments gone? There's none of them happening. So we've gone from six to eight hours, potentially, to about three minutes. All of these dash widgets are about three minutes out behind. Um, so what bits of New Relic are we using? We only, I only use it for uh, infrastructure and operations. So our developers are using it. We're using it in IT as a monitoring tool for the web platform. We're not really using some of the other fu the functions of it, um, which we should do. Um, we're using lots of NERQL, lots of dashboards, as you have saw, uh, lots of APM and APM stack traces. Um, they're just the two modules that we've purchased. We haven't had any of the others. Um, but New Relic lets us follow the chain, follow the, connect those dots so that when we see a downturn in a particular metric, we can start following to see, well, oh yeah, that's because that call to that service is failing, and that call to that service is failing because the response time we're getting from the car hire guy has gone through the roof, or whatever it might be. It allows us to find out where the problems are very easy. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, what's next? Yeah, so I've got two examples of real things that it actually fixed for us. This is an example of as if I didn't have enough problems, but it was a problem that we didn't know we had. And I don't know if we'd ever have spotted it normally. Like most companies, or reasonably good companies, we've got DDoS protection in our data centers, and we test it every so often. So we have three data centers running the website, and we found, thanks to APM and NERQL, because we wouldn't have found it otherwise, that when we had DDoS protection on, and someone was doing a PayPal transaction, one in nine of those PayPal transactions was failing. So it's a really tiny percentage of all of our payments, a relatively small, very small percentage of PayPal payments. And it was only happening when we had DDoS protection turned on in the data center. And much to the developer's delight, it was actually a network problem this time. So we've contacted PayPal, they sorted out a network problem on their end, I hasten to add, um, and we were able to fix the problem. Um, another example of um, where uh, NERQ, uh, NERQL and dashboards helped us directly was it was a mistake. We were doing a deployment in February. Uh, we were doing a desktop website deployment. And well, however it happened, the mobile backend API got turned off by accident. Um, so traditionally, that would have been Twitter going to customer servers, customer servers coming to IT, IT faffing about, looking around to try and figure out what, how, why is this not working, and finally fig figuring out that somebody switched it off by accident and turned it back on again. Probably between 30 and 60 minutes of troubleshooting. You can't really see it on the graph there, but that's three and a half minutes. The blue line is the number of availabilities that were happening per minute, with the yellow line showing what was happening last week. So the help desk guys saw that drop, and any drop like that on any of our graphs, we're all tuned into knowing that that's a bad thing. Help desk guys saw that, called it out, and three and a half minutes later, the service was turned back on again, and normal operations resumed. So we learned a few lessons from, from this. Two, the two biggest lessons that we learned with this were, the power that New Relic gave us to be able to spot problems so quickly and figure out a fix for them so fast, much faster than we'd ever be able to do the old way. Um, and the single biggest lesson that we learned from doing this was that you cannot let that Egypt do deployments. <laughs> do not let him do deployments, because he'll screw them up, definitely. I'm now banned from doing deployments, um, unless somebody's holding my hand. Uh, so that's what we learned from that lesson. Um, What's coming down the line? Well, so what else do we want to do with New Relic? And just as it happens this morning, the first one, my, my, my 
single biggest item on the wish list was baseline alerts for NERQL. And that's coming in June, I've been told today. Um, so we have baseline alerts uh, of a fashion at the moment, and we've got, um, now, now we've got the Nirvana. This will help us be able to get alerts that are timely and uh, usable for us, much better than we had before. We want more control, and Henry, please, <laughs> we want more control over widgets on the dashboard. So you saw our monitoring wall. We're looking at that from the length of this room and further. We can see it down the end of the room. Our eyes are tuned to look for certain things, but I could make it easier for people to spot stuff if I could just have a little bit of control over the dashboards and stuff, make lines thicker, change colors of stuff, things like that. Um, Seymour is going to be interesting for us when we get our hands on it. Um, the idea that there's metrics in there telling us stuff that I don't know about yet is, is kind of worrying, but Seymour will help us, I think, with that. It will bubble up to the surface interesting pieces of information for us that we mightn't have spotted ourselves. Um, we're looking at the browser option at the moment, um, and uh, New Relic are going to help us. Scrapers are a, are a pain in the ass for us. Um, screen scraping our prices and making bookings to our site. So we're looking at using some of the functionality of browser to be able to figure out whether a user is a real user or if it's a bot user. Um, and I think, oh, I need to go back one. Yes, this one. Um, sorry, Henry, but I did warn you. So that's a normal widget on our dashboards, right? Payments by status, I talked about it earlier on. 90% approval, 8%, 8 I think, declined. And that looks fine. So you look, I look, I'm sitting in the CTO's office and we're chatting about something and I glance out the window and I see that and the world is a happy place. That's good. I could equally see that one, and I think the world is a happy place, but that's declines are now 90%. See? See, it's not just me. They all see it too. <laughs> Fix that. Pin the down color to the metric. It's simple. I know you've got loads of cool stuff coming, but just give the intern something to do. Get them to fix that. <laughs> so I've not been paid by New Relic, see? Uh, well, I don't think we're doing questions, but I'm around. You'll find me. I'm the tallest guy in the room. Um, you'll find me afterwards if anyone wants to ask me anything. And that's it.